It has to be probably one of the most asked questions leading up to the Christmas season. Do you know what that question is? What do you want for Christmas? Now, I love this question because it takes the guesswork out of trying to figure out what it is you want for your loved ones or what they want for Christmas. And understand, I hate And I mean, I hate trying to guess and figure out what to get the people I love for Christmas. So here's what I do. Starting in October, I will ask each individual family member to sit down and write me their wish list. Now, let me be clear. This means you will sit down with pen or pencil in hand, and on a piece of paper, you're going to give me the top five or ten things you want for Christmas, and then I will take that list, and I will make sure that I will get you, if it is reasonable, and I can, I will get you at least one or two items on that list. I can't tell you how many adults have come up up to me and say, hey, can I give you my list? (laughs) But folks, now, parents... Let me counsel you. If you think that's a great idea and you're going to go to your kids next year and you ask them to give you a wish list, let me give you a piece of advice. You better make sure that at least one item on that list is under that tree or otherwise you're going to hear a lot of moaning, whining, and grumbling. You're going to have a wailing and gnashing of teeth on biblical proportions. Think the book of Revelation. So unless you want mourning on Christmas morning... I would suggest that you have at least one item from that list under the tree. Now, folks, so here we are, and and maybe you're asking yourself and you've been asking your family, what do you want for Christmas? And I want you to think about this. What do you want for Christmas? What What was at the top of your list this year? Because here's what I've noticed, that the older you get, the price tag goes up and it's harder to find. I mean, think about it. When you're a kid, all you want is a toy, and then when you get older, all you want is a new hip. Some of you got that. But, I mean, in all seriousness, think about it. When you're young, all you want is a toy. Now, some kids, all they want is the same toy everybody else is getting for Christmas. Have you ever noticed that happens? Think back to the 1980s. How many of you remember Cabbage Patch Dolls or Cabbage Patch Kids? Right? And I mean, I I remember video. I I remember watching the news. And and store managers would would have the doors locked. And there would be a mob outside the door. And the store manager would be there with a baseball bat. So that when he opened the door, nobody would stampede him and crush him to death. People fought each other in the aisles over these dolls. and, And there was one man who... Uh, He could see the pattern. I mean, he could watch the trend, and he decided to cash in on this. So back in October, he bought some 50 Cabbage Patch Kids, and then he went out and he was able to sell these $20 dolls for more than $200 a piece. Because heaven forbid my little Sally should show up to school and not have a Cabbage Patch doll like the rest of the kids. Now, when my kids were younger... All they really wanted for Christmas was toys. My daughter wanted a Barbie doll. My son wanted Legos. And it was was affordable and it was easy to find. And then they got older. And now it's violins and cameras and it's still Lego. And my son Justin, it wasn't just any Lego. Now it had to be Lego Technica because it had to have motors and it had to move. And the price tag went up. And it got a little harder to find. Oh, and then they got older. And now we want, we want um, iPads and skull candy, you know, headphones. And the price tag went up. Got a little harder to find. Then they got older. Now we want laptops and iPhones and Apple Watches. And the price tag went up and it got a little harder to find. Now they're adults and what they want is a car. <laughs> and the price tag went up and... Finding the money is harder to find. But as you notice, as we get older, the price tag does go up and things do become harder to find. But now here's what I've noticed. As I got older, I discovered that there was something out there that I needed, but money couldn't buy it. That there are some things out there that you can't purchase with your Platinum Gold MasterCard. For example, You can't find a cure for cancer at Amazon.ca. 
You'll never find a cure for your addiction at Starbucks because they're the ones who created it. And you, by the way, can't spend your way out of depression. You can't fix your marriage at the mall. And the one thing you can't find is fulfillment at Mandarin. You find some food, but you won't find fulfillment. And the one thing I discovered I needed most during the Christmas season, I couldn't find it online. And it was this, peace. And I'd like to suggest that peace is the most valuable and important thing you could have this Christmas season. But now, I wanted to ask you, what is it that makes something valuable? What is it that increases the value of an item? And here's what we know. It's rarity. The harder it is to find, the more it goes up in value. We call it the law of supply and demand. So if I have a lot of it and you don't want it, the price goes down. But if I have very little of it and you all want it, the price goes up. And the reason peace is so valuable is because we all need it. But for some reason, even during the Christmas season, it can be a little hard to find. So let me ask you, how do you go about finding peace? Like, what is it you do to pursue peace? Now, I know some people, you work. And, and you'll go out and you'll work hard and you make a lot of money and you put the money in the bank because you know that it will bring you financial security and you're hoping that down the road, financial security will buy you peace. Some of you, it's relationships. You're hoping to find the right bay or boo for those of you who are older, that's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You're looking for the one. You're looking for that soulmate. You're looking for the love of your life, thinking that if I could just have the right love in my life, I'd have some peace. For others, it's credentials. You got the masters, you got the doctorate, or you're looking for internet fame because if you had a raised social status, then maybe you would feel some peace. Can I ask, how is it that you go about finding peace? Because so many of us were pursuing it. And by the way, I know there are some of you, you're thinking, but really what I'm pursuing is happiness. I just want to be happy this Christmas season. Well, let me ask you something. Have you ever tried being happy when you were lacking in peace? Try being happy without peace. Peace is the most valuable commodity that you could have, and yet so few of us find it. Think about this for a moment. What do we put on somebody's tombstone? Rest in peace. Right? We put that on our loved one's tombstone because we're hoping they will find in the grave the one thing they didn't have while they were alive. I'm going to be an Adventist preacher here for a moment. And the Bible says that the living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. In the grave, they don't know happiness. They don't know joy. They don't know celebration. And they don't know peace because death is not designed to give you in the grave what you should have had when you were alive. Oh, let me say that again. I think it was a little deep. Death is not designed to give you in the grave what you should have experienced while you were alive. Now, let me tell you what God wants for you while you're alive. On the day that Jesus was born, the angels exploded on the scene, and they cried out, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards all people, all men, all women. God wants for you this Christmas to have peace. And yet, so for so many of us, it can be so hard to find. So, how do we, if God wants us to have peace, how do we go about pursuing and keeping our peace? And, and I was praying about this, and I was thinking back to a story. It's in Mark chapter 4, and if you don't have anything else to do today. I call it your homework assignment, your Sabbath assignment. Go back and read Mark chapter 4. I know some of you are going to read the Christmas story today, but take some time and read Mark chapter 4. It's a very famous story, and in this story, we, we have Jesus, and he gets into a boat with his disciples, and they're going out on the lake. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things that gives me peace is nature. And water. 
And, and I can imagine Jesus, he got in the boat and he stretched out. And, and he's got the sun on his face. There's the gentle breeze. There's the rocking of the boat, the lapping of the water. And it just lulls him to sleep. And while he's sleeping, later on in that day, a storm breaks out. And somebody, it's not just any storm. Like, it's not just some wind and some rain and a little thunder and lightning. This thing threatens to capsize the boat and take their lives. And, and somebody gets it into their head to look for Jesus. And they cry out, Jesus, Je Jesus, wake up. And Jesus wakes up. He takes a look into their situation. And he reaches out his hand and he speaks into their situation. And he says, peace, be still. Here's what I want for Christmas. I want Jesus to step into my life and my situation and all I want him to say is peace, be still. I mean, how wonderful would it be here this morning if Jesus stood on the platform next to me and he put his hand out and he spoke into our lives, peace, be still. I mean, can you imagine how wonderful it would be I don't know about you, but maybe you've got some gossips in your life. People who do a lot of talking about this and that, and they're tossing the dirt. And wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus walked up to the gossips and said, Peace, be still. What if Jesus showed up at your work? Imagine how wonderful it would be if the people standing, you know, maybe you've got people politicking. Maybe you've got people... Uh, complaining. Maybe you've got some tension or hostility at work. Some of you, you know what it's like to work in such a place. And imagine Jesus shows up at work and he goes, peace, be still. Or maybe you've got conflict in your life and people are at war with one another. And, 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 and you know, we live in a world where there's so much conflict. You don't have to look far to find conflict. And imagine Jesus walking up and going, peace, be still. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus went up to Parliament Hill and he called everybody together, liberals and conservatives, and he spoke to the nation and were politically divided, socially, economically, racially divided, and Jesus brings us all together and he says these words, peace, be still. Wouldn't it be wonderful if for Christmas... Jesus spoke that blessing into your situation and into your life. So if this is what God wants for our life, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we go about pursuing and keeping our peace? Everybody needs it. Everybody wants it. But it can be so hard to find. And so this morning, I just want to share with you three things, three simple things you can do to pursue and keep your peace. And, and, and the first one, before I, I turn the slide over, the first, I wanted to start with some wonderful theological thought. I, I wanted some biblical revelation. I wanted to share with you some opening thought where you went, whoa, Pastor Bob, hadn't seen that one before. And, and, and I wanted that for you, but I'm praying, and the Holy Spirit's leading, and, and what I have for you, it's going to sound a little like a bumper sticker. And, and, I, and I know that bumper sticker sayings don't really move people, and so you, maybe you're thinking, why would you share with us a, a, a bumper sticker saying? Because even though it's simple, it is profoundly true. So what is it? Well, if you want to pursue and keep your peace this Christmas, you got to pray. Uh, you see what I mean? You see what I mean about this statement? I know you know this. Uh, I know that you know that I know that you know this. We, we all know this. If I were to do a survey and ask you if prayer is important, I would imagine that 100% of you would respond, yes, Pastor Bob, prayer is important. So why is it so few of us are praying anymore? 
Why is it that the studies are showing us that when Christians uh, get out of bed in the morning or we start our day, that so very few of us are having a personal devotion first thing in the day? Why is it that when we get to the end of our day, the studies are telling us that less than 45% of Christians are having family worship in their homes? If we actually know that prayer is important, then why aren't we doing it? Because I'm here to tell you that according to the Word of God, where there is no prayer, there is no peace. Where do I get it from? Well, it's from Philippians 4, it's 6 and 7. And it reads, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. How do we do that? We do it through prayer. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see the connection? Where there is prayer, there is the supernatural gifting of peace. How do we keep our peace? It's through prayer. Now, understand, as I think back to the story in Mark chapter 4, the storm breaks out. They're in a situation. Their lives are being threatened. And what's the first thing they do? The first thing they do is they turn to Jesus. And guess what? They didn't have to look far because Jesus was already in the boat. Before they had set sail, before they had entered into their journey, they had made sure that Jesus was with them in the boat. I got to ask you, before your feet hit the floor, or as your feet hit the floor, or maybe even your knees hit the floor, do you start out your day by asking Jesus if he will get into your boat? Do you start each day knowing that there is a potential for a storm any day? Any day you could wake up and something could go wrong. This could be the day you lose your job. It could be the day you lose a loved one. It could be the day you get the bad news you're sick. Any day could be the day the storm breaks loose. And I'm asking you, are you starting your day by inviting Jesus into your boat? Because here's what you need to know. God is a gentleman. God will not force himself into your situation. And so if you want God to be with you at the end of the day, you've got to ask him to be with you at the beginning of your day. There was an old country preacher, and he put it this way, words of wisdom. He said, if you want me to be on the plane when it lands, you need to make sure I'm on the plane when it takes off. It isn't the true. If you want God to be with you at the end of the day, you need to ask him to be with you as the day begins. Because you have no idea what storm will break loose in your life or when it will break loose in your life. And Christian, let me tell you something. Let me share with you something. I've been there when the storm broke out and Jesus wasn't in my boat. And let me tell you something, when the storm breaks loose, it can rob you of your peace. There is nothing like a storm to rob you of your peace. And God says, don't be anxious, but in everything, talk to me. And and, and through supplication and with thanksgiving, I'll give you your peace. Are you lacking in peace? Uh, Is there a storm going on in your life right now? Have you got something in your life and it's messed up? It ain't working, it's falling apart. Does that in some way, shape, or form describe your life? And I've got to ask, did you pray? And, and, And I know that a lot of us, when the storm breaks, that's when we start to pray. And God will show up. But I'm telling you, it is so much better when Jesus is already in your boat. And so if you're wanting to pursue peace and keep your peace this Christmas season, can I suggest you start out by every day asking Jesus to get into your boat? That's the first thing. Second thing is this. If you want to pursue and protect your peace, you need to have the right perspective. In Scripture we read, it's Proverbs 23 and 7, For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Now here's what we know. 
our focus determines our direction. You've heard me share this before. I want to put it to you another way. How you see it will determine how you survive it. Let me say that again. How you see it will determine how you survive it. In other words, when the storm breaks loose, there are two directions you can look. You can either look in the direction of the storm or you can look in the direction of your Savior and that focus will determine how you survive it. And, and you see, when the storm broke out, I can tell you where the disciples were looking. They were looking at the storm, not Jesus. Now, how do I know that? Well, think about it. When they woke Jesus up, they didn't say, hey, Jesus, there's a God-sized problem here, and you got it. Uh, Jesus, there's a storm, and it threatens to wreck our life, but you are? You're the almighty God. You got this. Uh, they didn't wake him up and say, Jesus, we got a situation here, and we're going to surrender to you, because even if we were to die today, still, we would trust you. They didn't say any of that. What they said is, Jesus, we're all going to die. Do you care? It reminds me of a hymn. Does Jesus care? And, and how often do we, when we run into storms and we have pain and trouble in our life, we go singing that song, does Jesus care? And not to knock the song and those who love the song, can I suggest that if you're a mature Christian, and, and you've been a Christian and you've been at this for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, if 40 years later you're still asking if Jesus cares about you, can I suggest your focus is in the wrong direction? Rather than looking at the storm, can I suggest that maybe what you need to look at is the manger or the cross? You see, if you go back to the manger, here's what you will see. You will see God who came down and became flesh. And, and I know that that may not resonate with a lot of you, this idea that we get it. We talk about it every Christmas. We talk about it a lot. Jesus became a human being. Let me put it to you another way. The divine became dirt. Do you follow what I'm saying? We were made from what? We were made from the dust and the dirt of the earth. And when we die, what do we return to? We return to dust. Jesus, the divine, put on dirt. And he did it because he wanted you to understand this one important thing. That God, your heavenly Father, loves you. How far would you be willing to go to communicate to somebody else how much they are loved? Jesus cared about you so much that divinity put on dirt to let us know we are loved. And, and, if you, and if you go to the manger, this is God in the form of a baby coming down to let you know that God wants you to have peace on earth. And, and if that's not enough for you, then please go to the cross. Because here we have on the cross the divine willing to take on death in order to save you. Jesus Christ, Scripture says, no greater love has anyone than this, than they lay down their life for a friend. If you're wondering if in the storm God still cares about you, then may I suggest you shift your focus from the storm to the Savior. I remember one time, Actually, I remember the first time I went to an IMAX movie theater and I was invited by my, my girlfriend's family at the time to go and watch. It was a feature film on speed and the history of speed and our, our love with speed, right? From, from bicycles to rockets. And it was a 3D movie. And, and you know how that works. You got the 3D glasses, you put on the glasses, and all of a sudden, things take on an added dimension. And all of us are there, and of course, IMAX has to show off the lasers and the sound, and the sound hits you right here in the chest. You know, it's really impressive. My first time, and I'm like, wow, you know, this is amazing. And so we all put on our glasses. 
All of us, that is, except for my girlfriend's brother. His name was Kevin. And, and Kevin decided that he was going to go through the movie without putting on his glasses. And I'm like, why would you do that? Like, and he's just being stubborn, and he decides he wants to experience it without the glasses. So here's the rest of us. The, the, the movie starts out with a car chase, right? It's, it's the police, and they're chasing another vehicle. When they turned left, we turned left. And when they went right, we went right. And when they stopped, we stopped. And when the rocket took off, we went back, and we went up. All of us had that experience, except for Kevin. And the reason Kevin did not have the same experience as the rest of us is that he could not be moved by that which he could not see. I want to speak to the Kevins in the church right now. I want to speak to those of you who are coming to church and it's no longer moving you. Uh, you, you get into the Word and it's not moving you. Uh, you, 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 you get, you, you're not even involving yourself in spiritual things and you might be walking away from Jesus right now because it's not moving you. And maybe it's because your focus is on anything but your Savior. Our perspective determines our direction and how you see it will determine how you survive it. Last thing. If you want to keep your peace, remember the promises. And, and I've always said, and I'll always keep saying it, I don't put my trust so much in the promises as I put my trust in the one who made the promise. This is why I keep my gaze on my Savior, because the Bible says that my God cannot lie. That your God cannot change. And so this God who cannot lie, who cannot change, says this, Lo, I am with you always even till the end of the world. God has promised me that he will never leave me nor forsake me. My God has promised me that he will cause all things to work together for good. And he'd even promised me that even if I should die in my storm, if I believe, if you believe, you will live again. And, and what we all have in common is the knowledge that we're all going to die. If Jesus doesn't come, what we all, I don't care if you're an atheist, a Buddhist, or a Christian, or whatever it is you identify as spiritually or not, every single human being is going to die. But, not, and, but only those of us who have a relationship with Jesus have this promise that you have a way out of the grave. Which is why even when one of us dies, we have peace because we have the promise and the hope of the resurrection because God cannot lie and he will not change. We have a way out of the grave. Jesus came 2,000 years ago to ensure the fact that those of us who were destined for death would not die eternally. We have these promises. And our God has promised that regardless of the storm, he won't leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Does Jesus care? The song ends with, I know he cares. Do you know why he cares? Because he loves you. And, and, that, and, because, and this is who God is. He cannot lie. He cannot change God as love. And in that love, he'll never abandon you in your storm. His name was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And on July the 9th, 1861... He was asleep. He was taking an afternoon nap. And, and while he was sleeping, while he was napping, his wife Fanny had taken some of their daughter's locks or locks of her hair and she was putting them in an envelope. It was a keepsake. You know, one of those things that we do as mementos that remind us of our children's younger years. And, and as she was you know, collecting these, the, these locks of hair, she was putting them in an envelope and she was sealing them with hot wax. And Fanny was working nearby an open window and nobody knows how it happened. We're not sure how, uh, how, how the accident took place, but somehow her candle had touched her dress and had set fire to her dress and her dress went up like a fireball. She screamed. 
And, and Henry was awakened by her screams and her wails of pain. And in a panic, he jumped out of his bed. He ran into the kitchen area where Fanny was. And there was Fanny and she was just a ball of fire. And Henry did everything he could to save his wife. And in the process, he severely burned himself. Fanny had fallen into a coma. And the next day she had succumbed to her injuries and she died. Henry couldn't even attend her funeral. He'd been burned so bad that he was in the hospital while they had laid his wife to rest. For the next three years, that man grieved. Oh, don't get me wrong. He, he went to work. He did his job. He, he interacted with people. And, and you, wouldn't know if he was in, you wouldn't know he was in pain if you hadn't been a family or a friend. And for the next three years, he grieved the loss of his wife. And then three years later, he's 57 years of age. He's my age. And Christmas has rolled around and he's got kids. And, and he's praying to God and he's crying out to God. It's Christmas and he's saying, Father, I, I just, I don't have peace. I don't have peace, and it's Christmas, and it's supposed to mean something, and I'm not moved by it. Please, would you please just bring some peace back into my life? And as he lifted his head, he was inspired. He, he was inspired to start writing some of his thoughts and feelings out, so he grabs a pen and a paper, and he begins to write the following... I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then Henry lifted his head from the table, and, and he started to look at his world around him, because by now America was in the middle of the Civil War, and the Battle of Gettysburg was just behind them. And as he looked around his world, he saw conflict and division and war. And, and, and you could remember the sounds of battle. It wasn't so far away that he could hear the cannons blare. And then he wrote, And in despair I bowed my head. There's no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And he asked himself, how in the middle of war and conflict, where do we look around and find peace on this earth? And then God whispered in his heart, look up. Because your gaze determines your direction. And he started to look up and he started to look at his Savior. And he embraced the promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you and I will cause all things to work together for good. And Henry embraced the promise and the reality of who his Savior is. And he wrote this, Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God's not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Peace it is the most valuable thing you will ever own. And for so many, it is so hard to find. But not if you're a Christian. Not if you have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you're looking for peace this Christmas, can I suggest you start out and you pray. Pray to God. Give him thanksgiving. Have an expectation that God wants you to have peace on earth. And this God who loves you will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. If you have conflict in your life today and, and, and there's struggle and, and you are in the middle of a storm, can I ask you right now to shift your focus from the storm to your Savior? Because Jesus saves Jesus saves. And as you look towards your Savior, remember today that he cannot change, he cannot lie, and he promises this, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age.
the angel said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards all men. And if you're looking for peace this Christmas, look no further than a manger. Look no further than the divine who became dirt, who took on death so that you might live. God loves you. He wants you. And he will save you. And for all of you, that truly means peace on earth.